embryo may represent an, quote, environmental effect that is different between two fraternal twins or two mon uh, monozygotic twins. Several years ago, this was the cover of Science Magazine. It asks, what are the 125 most important questions we haven't figured out yet in science? Five or six of those questions got two or three pages of attention. Our question got a paragraph. And this is what the paragraph said. What is the biological root of sexual orientation? Much of the, quote, environmental contribution to homosexuality may occur before birth, excuse me, before birth, in the form of prenatal hormones. So answering this question will require more than just the hunt for gay genes. If you'll forgive the molecular biology professor for a minute, I'm going to show you some pictures of DNA. Oh, what's a gene? A gene is that thing. <laughs> that mess. That very complicated part of a chromosome. If I were to take one cell from any of you and extract the DNA and throw away everything that's associated with the DNA and the chromosomes and line up all of the chromosomes end to end, how long would it be? You have five seconds to consult with your neighbor and give me an answer. <laughs> All right, who's the best power forward in the NBA? Who? If you're a Utah Jazz fan, who, who was the best power forward in the history of the NBA? Carl Malone is six feet eight inches tall, and that's how much DNA unwound and straightened in a line is in one nucleus in a cell that you can't see. It's not a bad packing job. <laughs> and that's responsible for the packing job. And the DNA here is the gray material and it's wound around this other <coughs> bag of proteins. And then it gets even worse. because those all wind up in a ball. It's a little bit like the rubber band airplane you had when you were kids, and you would wind up the propeller, and the trick was to wind it one half turn before it broke so that you could fly as far as possible. And what happens to the rubber band motor? It coils up on itself, and genes coil up on itself, and that's what they look like. So. This is the task if you're going to turn on a gene. And the analogy has a lot of failures. But just imagine you're a plumber. And in order to turn on a gene, you have to go into that mess. And you have to find out where the start place is. And with your wrench, you pull the switch and the gene goes on. That's really, 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 really hard to do. And it turns out that there are mechanisms for either making it easier for the plumber to find the start place or harder. There are mechanisms for keeping genes shut off. There are mechanisms for turning them on. And they are, and they impact genes on top of this structure. That's why they are called by geneticists, by geneticists epigenetic phenomena. They exert themselves <coughs> on top of genes. And so if you just add one carbon and it's accompany, accompanying three hydrogens and you stick that on DNA, you can keep the DNA turned off. And if you add things like that, or a phosphate group with some atoms attached, and you attach that to the proteins around which the DNA is bound, you can keep the DNA off or on. And so, Sam and Fred 
identical twins, with identical genes, may be subjected to epigenetic phenomena such that even though they have the same DNA and they have an identical gene, in one of them the gene, the gene may be on and in another gene it may be off. Or it may be on at both times, but it may be on in different locations in the brain. Or it may be at different locations in the brain at different times in the, in the embryonic sequence. There's some supporting data for that that I'm not going to talk about. People reluctant to accept a biological explanation for homosexual orientation say, can't be. It violates evolutionary principles. How can a trait that tends to lower reproduction maintain itself in the population? Uh, there's a pretty good answer now, and that is that in the maternal line of gay men, the mothers and the grandmothers and the great-grandmothers have more children than their heterosexual maternal counterparts. Something about the genetics of homosexual orientation promote a greater capacity for childbirth. All right. We're going to move on now to ask Is there an explanation? Is there a mechanistic explanation? Nature has provided a couple of very interesting cases of real people with genetic anomalies. We have a question here. Yes. Uh, repeated twice in studies in Italy and more recently in the United Kingdom. How does that account then for homosexual I'm sorry. Sorry, how does that account then for homosexual women? I don't know of any data that apply to homosexual women with regard to fecundity, with the ability of a, lo a population, uh, a genetic, uh, hereditary line of people to have more children. All right, there's a very, I think it's proper to say unfortunate, human condition. This is the acronym. This is the long name. The adrenal gland, that's the gland up in the back, up on top of our kidneys makes a steroid hormone called cortisol. There's a mutation in these individuals where that doesn't happen. This is what happens. Don't pay any attention to the de details. Don't be scared off. All of these elliptical structures represent steps in making steroids. All of the arrows represent the enzymatic machines that make the various steps to make the steroids. One of them doesn't work in individuals with CAH. So it's a little bit like the Detroit assembly line. If one of the workers doesn't show up, then the car is diverted from that pathway and goes somewhere else along the assembly line. And in these people, it goes to testosterone. So these people are exposed to a very, very high, abnormally high level of testosterone during embryonic life. Now it doesn't seem to impact men, but it has a significant impact on women. I'll read only one of the lines from the discussion of several studies that have 